Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Johnson and today I will be doing a presentation on Ethnic Notions by Marlon Riggs. Um, so just a little background before I get into the close reading. Um, this documentary blatantly recalls the most popular depictions of black people throughout history. Um, so when you ask questions like, why do people assume that all black people like watermelon? Or why do white women just inherently clutch their purse at the sight of black men? Um, I know I'm familiar with the Aunt Jemima, which is now the Pearl Milling Company, their original logo with the Mammy caricature on the label. Um, and all of this actually stems from the propaganda narrated by the oppressors and popularized leading up to the Civil War of 1865. Um, this was used to justify the dehumanization of black people both during and after the Civil um, both during and after enslavement. Um, and the black individual in America was deemed by American culture to fit into one of the five categories detailed in the film. So that's just a little introduction. Um, so now about the artist. This is Marlon Troy Riggs, born February 3rd in 1957 in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, he was a military brat growing up, and because of this, he moved between Texas, Georgia, and West Germany at a really young age. Um, despite not really feeling like he had much of a home, he was extremely talented. Um, in high school, Riggs actually played football, um, ran track, and stood out academically at his school, and he also had a very big part in his performing arts sector of school as he actually, you know, did dances for his school. So he was very well-rounded, and upon graduating high school, Riggs entered Harvard University where he discovered his sexuality. So he realizes at this point that he actually is a gay man and he wants to study homosexuality but the problem is that between 1974 and 1978 there was a very limited number of research done on homosexual men therefore Riggs actually conducted an independent study focusing on male homosexuality in American fiction and poetry. Upon graduating magna cum laude, by the way, in 1978, Riggs moved to Oakland, California with an interest in filmmaking. Um, so after graduating from the University of California, Berkeley in 1981 with a master degree in journalism and documentary filmmaking, um, in about six years, Riggs actually released his first production, which was Ethnic Notes. Um, this documentary also won an Emmy Award the same year it was released. And following this film, Riggs produced a number of other ones, like in 1989, called Tongues Tied. Um, he releases Affirmations in 1990, Anthem in 1991, Color Adjustment in 1992, No Regret in 1993, and his final piece, Black Is, Black Ain't, in 1995. Um, these are all documentaries where Riggs breaks down, breaks barriers as he finally gives black gay men a voice to express the struggles that are specific to gay men, which were more ignored at this time than in today's time. Um, his unapologetic documentations leave no room for confusion in understanding the systems of oppression he researches, which we will definitely see in his film, Ethnic Notions. All right. 
So let's start with the birth of the first harmful racial stereotype, which came in the 1820s. And there's actually a very interesting story behind it. So we're going to watch a clip. Uh, just give me one second. Okay. D.D. Rice brought a new sensation to American theater. Rice was known as an Ethiopian delineator, a white comedian who performed in blackface. The name of his routine would later become the symbol of segregation in the South. The Jim Crow was a dance that started on the plantations as a result of dancing being outlawed in 1690. Dancing was said to be crossing your feet by the church. And so the slaves created a way of shuffling and sliding to safely glide around the laws without crossing their feet. The slaves had a saying for their cunning in skirting the law. Wheel about and turn about and jump just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. According to legend, T.D. Rice saw a crippled black man dancing an exaggerated Jim Crow dance. Rice took the man's tattered clothes and that night imitated him on stage. It was an instant success. And America loved it. And a bevy of imitators came about. Uh, literally hundreds of men tore up their clothes, discarded their their perfect dialects of the black man and began to do this exaggerated character dance which became known as the Jim Crow character. Okay. So as described that was the very first um, black caricature coined in US history. Um, and as I also said, it soon became a household name with imitations sprouting all throughout the country. And the character was soon recognizable all throughout the country and soon a favorite, actually, of white people. Um, and this solo act called The Delineator soon in 1843 became known as the minstrels when groups of men would get together and imitate the... Jim Crow caricature, which evolves into the Sambo caricature. So the Sambo is de um, described as someone content and complacent in a situation. He's unproductive and lazy, enjoys to sing and dance and eat very, very much to the point where it's childlike and he has a heart like he can't work because he loves to eat, dance, and sing. Um, so I have another clip. In the, in the period immediately before the Civil War. So blessed with moderate work, with ample fare, with all the good the starving pauper needs, the happier slave on each plantation leaves. I am leaves. quite sure they never could become a happier people than I find them here. No tribe of people have ever passed from barbarism to civilization whose progress has been more secure from harm, more genial to their character, or better adapted to their intellectual feebleness than the Negroes. Oh, handy banjo down the play. We'll make it ring both night and day. If we care not what the white folks say. They, they can't, can't get, get us to run, run away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me go back. So the notion of the Jim Crow early Sambo character was pretty much to represent that uh, as the voiceover said that the slave is happy and content and therefore pretty much 
shouldn't be doing anything else besides being a slave and um, not allowing the slave to be a slave would be a disservice to them is pretty much what that's saying. But what I love what Marlon Briggs did in that moment was he showed the real images of slavery while they're saying that really just to put that side by side together to say that these words don't match up with the images, not with real life. Um, but we're going to see that a lot. Um, and I think it's also important to note that these images actually gain notoriety at the same time as the abolitionist movement. And oddly enough, these images were most well received in the North. Um, this fact is especially more important because there's just significantly less black people in the North than the South. So this image was a quick an adaptable substitute for having actual black people in the area to understand at all for northerners. Why um, support these stereotypes in abolition? I don't know. But anyway, after the Sambo came, a plethora of other images and what came directly after the sambo was actually the coon um, and so the zip coon pretty much was the freed black man living in the north who um, is failing to assimilate to whiteness he tries to imitate a white man's voice and actions and beings, but he ends up being the fool and the butt of the jokes. Um, so pretty much the notion behind this character was to say that um, there's no reason for black men to be freed because they cannot fit into society in a productive way which directly ties into the sambo which says he's actually more happy as a slave so these both are working to defend slavery and shield how brutal it really was um, and so following the coon um, black women we get our own character which is the mammy the obedient, loyal, protective overseer of the plantation. And I have another clip to show about this caricature. She was always presented as docile, loyal, uh, protective of the White House and the big house, an indication that, um, that she understood um, the value of the society. She is presented almost as an antithesis of the white lady, and the person who does not have the qualities of fragility and beauty which would make her valued in the society. With her hair hidden beneath a bandana, her ample weight, dark skin, and coarse manners, the mammy was stripped of sexual allure. Faithfully, she served the master's household in popular fiction and theater, but here her presence never evoked sexual tension. If the mammy were to be a sexual being, which of course in reality she was, but if she was, were to be that in myth and in fiction and so on, she would become a threat to the mistress of the house. She would become a threat to the entire system. Okay, so um, as we see from that clip, uh -huh, just a much more detailed um, description of the mammy, but we also see how these images were manipulated so poorly because 
that is clearly not what happened during slavery. And that's clear by how many mixed and one fourth and eighth and the breakdown of fractions of mixed white people were or white and black people were at this time. So um, these images all work together to really fit the white male's fantasy of this cohesive society that all works together and slavery is definitely one of the back dr the or the driver of that like so um yeah that was the mammy and um in addition to them describing her physical attributes as being so opposite of the standard of woman at that point um the erasure of her desirability also comes from her personality, where she is actually the leader of her household. The mammy leads and is strong and dominant, whereas the black male Sambo or Coon are both submissive and weak in comparison. So basically flipping what is very normal to this society and even normal today um kind of just to show that blackness was the polar opposite of whiteness pretty much and I guess just how that worked in every aspect how opposite they were but at the same time how much these also painted how much black people needed white people so i don't know well i mean it's just yeah um so these three characters the sambo the coon and the mammy they all came before the civil war and so that's a really important component too, is that these are the images of slaves. These are the images of what, I guess you could say like good black people are in this definition um, because they are content where they are. Um, if they weren't in the position that they were in, they would be clown foolish and a waste of space ideally and completely complacent with their situation so post civil war now what the south is trying to get across is that without slavery the black person is completely not okay at all so these images of black people as savage like as animalistic um they begin to really uh become more prevalent and as we talked about in class the birth of a nation that film uh there's a really good clip in the document that we will watch to really get a feel for how the shift pretty much in behavior. Okay. Racial hysteria was seen in every aspect of popular culture. <laughs> The best example of, of this was in the writings of, of Thomas Dixon in his uh, novel, The Klansman, which then later became a hit Broadway play and was finally adapted as the most successful of early American motion pictures, The Birth of a Nation. Described by President Woodrow Wilson as history writ in lightning, Birth of a Nation captured on film the classic caricature of blacks following Reconstruction. Here, emancipation was viewed as a tragic mistake. It had ended slavery and let loose blacks' wildest passions. 
brute Negroes played by whites in blackface pursued white virgins. These images were guaranteed to incite racial violence, but more, they justified it. Okay. So that was a clip um, from the movie Birth of a Nation. And if you see the picture here um, for the um, black um, person as the menace to society, I did not pick a character of that. I actually picked a picture of the Birth of the Nation um, movie posters because I was so shocked actually to see that the... Well, surprised but not surprised disappointed not surprised that these clan men are portrayed as like heroes as knights almost coming to save the day pretty much so to combat the fear instilled by these new freed black people were the safe and you know the protectors of the democracy almost the Ku Klux Klan um, so I just thought that was really interesting thinking about these images versus reality, but how much that does blur the lines. Um, so like I said, um, this shift between the loyal black character that we saw before, that was very non-threatening. We now get this fearful depiction between the civil rights and the reconstruction era. Um, and it really just shifts the the point that the slaveholders are trying to get across pretty much, which is that black people need to remain slaves. So um, this also really reminds me of um, this like depiction of black people as violent and menaces really reminds me of make america great again but just in a a more overt way way more overt but that same sentiment that society will never be the same now that there's not this oppressive system in place which you know is not fair or cool or true even but just the the way that they were able to make these definitions up before the black person was able to define themselves is what really gave it the power that it has today where it has been so indisputable in some people's minds um and so similar to the black man which is especially portrayed as the menace to society we have the piccaninny Um, And this is the child, the image for black children post-Civil War, which is basically the menace in child form. Um, I have another clip to show for that one. Let's see. Black children, or pickaninnies as they were once called, showed them as victims. Victims who evoked not sympathy, but the feeling that blacks were subhuman. They are always on the river, on the ground, in a tree, partially clad, dirty, their hair unkempt. This suggests that there was a need to imagine black children as animal-like, as savage. 
if you do that, if you make that step and say that these children are really like little furry animals, then it's much easier to justify the threat that's embodied in having an alligator pursuing the child. So um, as we saw by that clip, it's there's no other word to call it but dehumanization. It really is not. But um, I think when it comes down to the child, the child images, the images of children, it's really gross and disgusting because at this time around the Reconstruction era, black children were killed. They were murdered. And not to say that any murder is okay or justifiable, but this definitely desensitized people completely to these children, these innocent children who were just born. Um, it just is really sickening. And the Piccaninny actually found a lot of book covers of the Piccaninny. So this, I hope this box is not in the way. This is a book cover. And there were many, many book covers of Little Pekingese. Um, If you've heard the three little monkeys jumping on the bed, that actually came from this. Um, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch an N-word by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. These nursery rhymes, these things that are designed for children were were designed for children because they were most definitely fed to the white children but um just in a way just about children and for children so in a way everybody's kind of against each other from birth from as soon as possible and that was how powerful these images really were because you didn't have to explain to your child these offensive things and what they mean they just watched it and learned it and grew up with these images and later first they were images novels and then turned into movies and franchises and advertisements so it really went really far um Another thing about cartoons, I thought this was really interesting. It's going to look very familiar. Oh, um, it's going to look very familiar. die, you can make one last wish. Yeah? Well, uh, let's see now. Um, I wish, um, I wish, um, I wish I wasn't the king. Hooray! Hooray! Oh, congratulations, it's all too bad, too bad. Can't come respect from along. Fantastic, isn't it? Wine run all night. Yes, Bugs Bunny. Um, so we see here in this clip, um, it's a cartoon. We know the Looney Tunes. I'm sure everybody's pretty um, aware of the Looney Tunes and they make new episodes on Cartoon Network now. Um, and so to just describe that joke a little bit, um, the I forget what the other little character's called, but he's as Bugs Bunny. All right, this is, what's your last wish before you're gonna die? And he says, he starts to sing a song. And uh, if you hear the word Dixie, that's actually a term for the Confederate States. So he starts singing a song of wishing to return back to the Confederate States when the Confederacy ruled. You know, of course we know what that's 
alluding to and then instantly the people turn out they turn into sambos that's the sambo caricature um and start immediately singing and completely forget the facts you know for the stick of the show forget the fact that they were supposed to kill him they just magically poofed into black people magically poofed onto a cotton field um and finished the song with him and everything was fine and that really was how they were advertising black people and what's crazy about that clip is that looney tunes came out in 1930 so whatever year that that specific episode came out was after 1930 so that's almost 60 years after slavery after the abolishment of slavery where they're still pushing these images to mass media that black people want slavery again that's messed up and that's so misleading and it's so the effects that it's had that's leaked into today's time are crazy but those are our five um images our five stereotypes and so now i wanted to talk about the costume um so of course up until 1903 which was the first um, black man to ever be in a film. Um, white actors dressed in blackface. So uh, here's pictures at the bottom of white people actually in blackface. And you see that they, as they did in the cartoons, tried to emphasize um, certain physical features like very big lips, um, hair, unruly, wild, all over the place. And they actually didn't even call it hair. They would call it wool. Um, just a very <gasps> surprise at everything, doesn't really know what's going on attitude. And what's so funny is that when they would put on these outfits, they would just be like the perfect um mimic of a black person of course but interestingly enough interestingly enough um these two pictures at the top that is a man named Bert Williams um and so he was actually a you know what we're gonna watch the clip first and then I'm gonna talk let's watch the clip Black face artist. Oh, I know what you're thinking. I mean, I have heard all the rumors myself. It seems that this black face makeup, my white gloves, and my comic gait ain't the only thing I'm becoming famous for. What is it? Infamy. I have been trying to finish Bird's show for him. And uh, my eulogy to Bird will be to finish the finale, you know, on his life by elevating him to the class of a folk artist and a folk hero that I think that he deserves. Well, now you take last night, for example. I had just finished my show when I was uh, about to step out from our evening constitution when I came upon a, what appeared to be a perfectly delightful watering hole. So I stepped up to the bar and I asked the man for a bourbon. Well, the fella didn't take too kindly to serving a Negro. And so, to impress his friends, he said, that will be $50. Hell, I didn't bat an eye. I just stepped up to the bar, reached down in my pocket, whipped out a $500 bill and said, I'll take 10 <laughs> I 
how how we love that's right I wait around outside the press club, just shifting my way from one foot to the next until somebody comes by and escorts me in. So all the time, I'm just hoping and praying that nobody comes out and mistakes me for the doorman and tips me a quarter. You know, it's no disgrace being a black man. But it's terribly inconvenient. So what that was um, actually somebody part of the documentary kind of finishing Bert Williams' story. So he was actually a very um, well-educated black man in the early 1900s um, who actually became one of the most notable um, min ministrels at this time. So um, I just thought this was really interesting because I can't decide for myself. So of course we have to talk about this in class, whether this is an act of reclaiming this um, image of a black person and kind of taking it into our own hands because the documentary does say that he was able to change his role as he got more famous to be less just blatantly offensive and wrong um or do you guys think that this is kind of just more of an act of conformity and a quick easy way to make money within a society that is portraying black people in a negative light i don't know kind of both kind of i'm not sure but blackface remained um something very prominent within movies and film up until world war ii so literally white men the oppressors are, white men and women are portraying the black person in the light that they want to portray them as for their benefit and it kind of affects everybody so um my last slide is on the black psyche and about how all these things from the theater to these cartoons to these images and compared to the realities of slavery, of Jim Crow, and of civil rights movements, um, where this disconnect was on how Black people actually are and exist in America. Um, pretty much as the time went on between um, the civil rights era, um, the civil war era to the civil rights era, um, characters always evolved and constantly related to the, so the current social climate. Um, while the overall message maintained the same of black people's inferiority, um, they invented the narrative that black people don't belong or are not as accepted of members in society unless they have been domesticated by enslavement. Um, and it wasn't until the civil rights movement of the 1960s where we see any leniency in the outright just egregiousness of these images. Um, and even then they were not erased. They were just um, kind of toned down and made more subtle. Um, but I'm gonna show one more clip. I'm sorry, Dr. Maynard, one more clip. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the middle of a video, okay. Anyway.
When I look at the material from the 1970s and 1980s, I basically see the same thing I saw I see in the earlier materials. I see greeting cards with big heavy mammies on them. I see TV programs with uh, a mammy figure in the household. I see uh, black comedians playing the role of the minstrel or the buffoon in movies and so forth. I have students, both black and white, who believe these images huh? because it has become a thread throughout the major fiction, film, popular culture, the songs, even the jokes black people make about themselves. It has become a part of our psyche. It's a real indication that one of the best ways of maintaining a system of oppression has to do with the psychological control of people. Mammy. Um, and just to really leave us. Oh, crap. I'm not sure if that played. But um, just to kind of leave us off with that on how these images affected not only how white people portrayed black people, but how black people portrayed themselves at such a volatile time of um, the abolishment of slavery and not knowing what life looked like. There was already images of what a black person should look like or should act like. And it was so strong to the point where these more subtle um, remnants of it that lasted throughout the 60s, um, you know, they didn't need to be over anymore. They didn't need to be spoken things anymore to be understood. It kind of became a part of being conscious of race in America. So um, yeah, that was the effects of these images on our culture. Thank you guys so much for listening.